Welcome back to Comic Book News. Today we're revisiting uh, the subject of our last video, which was House of X number two. Now I went over some of the story events, and uh, now I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the timeline. That's right, the many lives of Moira X today on Comic Book News. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to uh, Cerebro Central. Here today we're going to talk about uh, House of X number two. We're going to go a little more in depth into the multiple timelines of Moira McTaggart, uh, also known now, I guess, as Moira X, or is it Moira 10? Uh, let's talk about that because we've got uh, the complete timeline here in high resolution. You couldn't really see it very well on the million dollar comic book cam, but now we can see it in high res. And we're going to talk about it. And as we can see, is it Moira X or is it Moira 10? For that matter, is it Moira or Moira? Who knows how to really pronounce that thing? I'm, I'm, I don't think I've met a Moira before. So uh, anybody know? Put it in the comments. Um, and also, uh, hey, if you haven't already, take a moment to hit the subscribe button. We're really trying to get to our, the next level of 300 subscribers. We're really close and I would really appreciate it. Back to the timeline. Uh, we're going to go through these 10 timelines, but as we can see right away, something's weird, right? Timeline six is completely missing. So let's go through each one of those and talk about the implications of that. And uh, we'll also talk about the overall implications of what the revelation of uh, Moira McTaggart as a mutant and the specifics of her power really mean, because I feel like it has implications not just for her, not just for the X-Men, but really for the entire Marvel Universe when you think about it. So uh, let's let's dive in a little bit deeper, shall we? Uh, so um, let's go with life one. This was Moira's first life, right? She was born Moira Kinross. Uh, she went to the Edinburgh Academy. And see here we see in the timeline, uh, we can go up here and see, she meets Kenneth Cowan, falls in love. Then she meets Charles Xavier. She says in the in the comic uh, she wasn't really impressed by him, so didn't make uh, much impression on him on her at all. Uh, she kind of thought he was a jerk, actually. Marries Kenneth Cowan, gives birth to twin boys, Caleb and Dean, and then to a daughter named Abigail. Now, could these be mutants as well? Could that be a potential? I don't know, backdoor or some sort of. Uh, uh, Another secret within secrets and another potential spin on uh, Moira's immortality? Maybe. After the daughter's born, her husband dies, Moira died at age 74 of congestive heart failure. Right? And then, presumably, she came back through the timeline, right? Looped back around and started her second life, right? Where she was born Moira Kinross again. Now this time around, according to the to the book, she has her complete um, adult memories from her first life and from all of her lives subsequently. Yet she does not have her mutant power of uh, of uh, resurrection because uh, she hasn't reached the age of thirteen where the X gene uh, first manifests. Um, but. How would she have her own memories? Isn't that kind of like a mutant power? Well, I think I, I, I've maybe earned a no prize uh, thinking about this a little bit. And my explanation is this. Some mutants are born uh, without a sort of a secondary mutation, if you will, or, or, or a fully formed mutant powers, but they have physical manifestations of their powers. Nightcrawler, perfect example, right? He was born looking the way he looks and presumably... He did not gain the power of teleportation until puberty when the X gene kicks in, etc. So, you know, if we want to use that as a you know possible guide, we could say physically she is born with a brain fully formed with memories as a result of her previously manifested mutant power. Um, but now it does not manifest until the age of 13. And the implication, and not even the implication, the stated... Um, fact about this is that if she is to die any time before the age of 13 in any of these lives, the cycle would end, she would not resurrect, and that would be the end of her natural lifespan and presumably uh, the last timeline. 
So uh, on to life two, uh, where um, she meets her uh, original uh, man she fell in love with, um, but does not fall in love. And this is where Hickman brought up the really kind of subtle and interesting, beautiful point about the sort of ephemeral nature of love and spontaneity and how, um, you know, just because something happened once the right way doesn't mean you can recapture that magic, that genie in the bottle. I think that's kind of a, um, that's kind of a, a beautiful little detail of the story. So at uh, age of 16, Moira enrolls at Oxford, uh, becomes a biology professor, founds the Muir Research Institute at age of 31, and then dies in a plane crash. So not the most exciting of his lives, but what that led to was her revelation because when she wo woke up in the womb with her fully formed two lives worth of memories, previous to this, she finally realized what she was, right? So um, year three, or life three, um, enrolls at Oxford at 16 again. Um, this time uh, meets and marries Charlie Xavier, right? They go on to establish the Xavier School for Gifted Children and presumably the X-Men live out that timeline as the sort of like Moira and Charlie uh, X-Men, uh, but eventually dies in a sentinel attack. Presumably as the sort of uh, days of future past uh, humans plus sentinels scenario takes over. Now, this is a huge theme in all of these lives. And this is what Moira f first realizes after this life, right? And now she's back uh, we're into life five. Um, this sort of reddish one here. Again, this time she says, I'm not wasting any time. I'm going to go meet Xavier as soon as my power manifests itself. Um, together, they sort of, she reveals her powers and her memories to Charles again, presumably. And, you know, sees the mistakes. So Charles sees the mistakes of her previous life. Uh, that she knows already, and they decide to found uh, a mutant nation. Kind of sounds similar to, I don't know, Genosha or even to uh, the Krakoa idea that's happening right now. So what lessons did they learn from that? It's hard to say, because at age of 43, she was uh, injured in a sentinel attack and uh, went into a coma and then died at the so-called genocide at Faraway, which I think we can assume is, an, I, I think from the book was another sort of sentinel um, robotic genocide. Now, what happened in her sixth life? We don't know. What's the implication of that? That means something happened. I mean, it means she definitely lived past 13. Her mutant gene definitely manifested. Is it possible she just died in very soon after it manifested and nothing happened? I guess that's possible but I think it's probably unlikely. So more likely something probably really interesting and important happened in this sixth life that uh, will be revealed at some point in the future. Just another little uh, element of mystery among many in uh, Hickman's stories and story and one of the reasons I'm really enjoying this. On to life seven, presumably she died in life six, and this time, she gets hardcore. This is when Moira decides, look, I, Sentinels, I'm not going to die by Sentinel attack again. So uh, we got to destroy whoever created the Sentinels, right? And uh, all, so Bolivar Trask, she decides to spend her entire life basically hunting down and killing Bolivar Trask and Donald Trask and anyone related to it, anyone that comes from the lineage of the Trasks. Um but then uh, dies at age 49. She's now in this timeline, she's like a crazy assassin person. She didn't go into science at all. She just went into military training. So presumably she has a lot of this military uh, training and everything that she learned in that life. You know, that's part of her in all the subsequent lives too. Um, discovered a wild master mold facility and I guess realized that the Sentinels were kind of an inevitable reaction of humanity to mutant kind. 
on to the eighth life. And now I don't know if this means anything or is just a design choice, but why does the eighth life circle around the top while all of the other lives except the eighth and the tenth, why do those ones circle around the top and, and all the other ones circle around the bottom? Does that mean something? Is it just for balance in the picture? Um, or is it somehow more meaningful? I don't know, but I want to know. Um, so anyway, we're on to uh, um, Life 8, where Moira uh, decides, look, I can't stop the mutant, can't stop the sentinel, so war between humanity and the mutants involving sentinels is inevitable. So maybe I've been all mixed up about this uh, bald Xavier dude, and maybe the answer lies you know, with um, uh, a certain silver-haired uh, devil known as Magneto, right? So Moira in this life joins Magneto, and uh, Magneto conquers America, establishes the House of M. Is that the House of Moira or House of Magneto or both? I don't know. Um, only to have Magneto die in a war in the War of M, presumably humanity again rebelling against you know uh, this version, the sort of militant Magneto strain version. Uh, Moira is imprisoned and dies in a failed prison attempt. So what do you learn from that in Life Nine? Well, Life Nine, Moira decides. Well, you know what, Magneto was great and everything, but maybe it wasn't enough. You know, maybe we really, maybe I need to work with somebody a little older and a little more mature and a little more powerful. So uh, in, in this ninth life, Moira teams up with Apocalypse, who kills Charles Xavier, kills Magneto. And uh, uh, they resurrect, they bring the, the horsemen to Earth, right? And uh, it's Moira and Apocalypse who form the X-Men. Okay, and they enslave Mr. Sinister, and the Apocalypse War begins. And what's really interesting about this is we don't see the end of this timeline. Now, pre presumably, Moira has to die. I mean, Apocalypse is arguably immortal, and perhaps has perhaps she gained some powers from him or, 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 or what have you. Um, but if she's living this next life, she ha must have died at some point. We just don't know when. It could have been thousands of years into the future, uh, it could have been um, a lot sooner than that. We just don't know, right? Because we don't know where this went. And presumably the way that these are checked, just like the next one is checked, and this one led directly to um, the issue that we're reading to House of X number two. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that... Uh, this is eventually going to point to one of the future issues, most likely in Powers of X, where they're sort of exploring all the different far future timelines. It's just my first prediction. We'll see if that's meaningful at all. And finally, that brings us to the 10th life of Moira McTaggart. And is it the last one? Well, I think we can assume no, because she's obviously already manifested her mutant power, right? Now, Destiny told her that she could foresee 10 or 11 lives for Moira. So clearly it's at least 11 it's going to be. Unless they figure out some way, maybe they can strip away her power and then kill her. And that would stop her from resurrecting. I suppose something like that would be possible. Rogue could absorb it. They could kill her. I don't know. Um, it's possible, but what I think is more likely is what I'll talk about in a second. And now let's look at the 10th life. Now the ninth life will wrap right back around on the bottom, but the 10th life again is wrapping um, all the way around the top. And I don't, I, I'm not sure what it means. And neither are you. So in, in this 10th life, this is the life that we know in the Marvel Universe. So this is the life of Moira McTaggart that we've known and read about. Um, so she enrolls in Oxford, she met Xavier, she married Joseph McTaggart, they found the, founded the Muir Research Institute, she wins the Nobel Prize, she gives birth to Proteus, uh, Moira and Xavier recruit Magneto, I'm trying to think, this is, oh yes, this is when, I guess when, when uh, Magneto came to lead the X-Men for a while and, and, and Xavier went into outer space, I think, 
later on, that sort of uh, alliance between Xavier and Magneto and, and Moira, I guess, broke up. And there's a schism uh, that happened. Then there was the, the new X-Men, Grant Morrison's run with the genocide at Gen Genosha, where 16 million mutants were killed, something like that. Um, and year 50 here, it says Moira fakes death. Shargalm, but wait a second. That's not right. Jonathan Hickman issued a correction on Twitter. Let's go over to his Twitter page real quick and, and see what he has to say. Apparently, this was a typo, right? And year 49 and year 50 should have been reversed. So uh, let's make sure that we go back and mentally make note of that. So in other words, in year 49, Moira fakes her death. Now, I researched this a bit because this was a period where I was not uh, an avid X-Men reader, to say the least. And apparently this is something Hickman has sort of introduced in order to, uh, I guess she died in, in a more recent storyline or was killed. And as sort of, this is sort of an introduced retcon to say, no, she didn't die. It was like a Shire imposter. And now here we are at the House of X and we're, at, we're right up to date. Here we are in um, issue number two of House of X. Uh, I think this is really interesting stuff. What's the implication here for the Marvel Universe? What does this mean for the future of the X-Men stories? Um, well, let's, uh, let's talk about it. So, um, to me, this offers... There, there's two things that I could see happening here. One, uh, Moira... Uh, th this is her life. She's going to live on. She's going to be an integral part of the X-Men for a long time to come. And that if she dies, it would reboot the X-Men universe, essentially, right? So are they waiting to save that in the future in case this stuff doesn't stick? I don't think so. I, I What I think is going to happen, and what I think is coming, um, and what kind of makes sense to me, would be um, a Moira dies in this timeline, and that could reboot the entire X-Men that gives them a chance to completely revamp the continuity up till today. They don't have to go back and spell it all out because in our to, to the X to everyone in the X-Men would still be current time and day, just the history of not just the X-Men but the Marvel universe was has been dramatically altered. Now depending on how they play that, did did does Moira reveal her existence this time? Maybe she maybe she dies in this 10th timeline in the 11th is killed before her power manifests. And what does that mean for the X-Men? That means an X-Men without Moira McTaggart, without Charles Xavier having knowledge of any of these previous timelines or any of the stuff that he's had so far. It gives us a chance at a really clean and fresh kind of reboot. Um, and, and, and also a potential way to merge in the X-Men in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or at least like some ideas of how they could play around with this idea. Uh, so Moira is essentially like, she is like um, an ace in the hole, right? We can reboot at any time. We've also got the option to say if we can somehow stop her from reincarnating, as I suggested before, maybe you could uh, uh, remove her powers and kill her. That would end all these multiple timelines from being spawned ever again, and that would keep us in the one true timeline. Well, what's the answer? I don't know, but I'm happy to find out. Man, this is exciting. There's a brand new X-Men series written by Hickman coming out after all of this House of X, Powers of X stuff shakes out. Um, I really think, uh, like I said, it's possible that the Apocalypse Lifeline timeline the life nine we're going to see that it intersects into um, powers of x into one of those far future scenarios and ultimately i think as confusing as that stuff was to me like uh, between the two i like house of x a lot more than powers of x i thought it was a little overly complicated and convoluted and complex but maybe that's the idea is to show that this is where all this sort of time traveling uh stuff begets a sort of like muddled, confused nonsense. And maybe we can just nip that in the bud and wipe it out and and not say that stuff can't happen or won't happen, but at least uh, give us a, like, we don't have to know what the future is going to bring for a while, right? Like for the first time, we can just sort of live the X-Men life and, uh, uh, and, and not know what's coming and have a source of fresh new stories and new ideas for this franchise. It's long overdue. 
Uh, it'll breathe life into the comics, hopefully, and maybe we'll see the best of this stuff make its way into the movies. Or maybe not. What do you think? Uh, I want to hear what you have to say. Please put your comments uh, down below and uh, let me know what you think. Is this um, the freshest of the freshness or is this kind of like just yet another chapter that's destined to be forgotten and not stick in the long and like varied history of the X-Men? Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to find out. Thanks for watching.